I have a lot of heroes of faith in my life, and, and many of them obviously from the Bible. Uh, many of them people who have lived since the, uh, since the time of Christ and the example of their lives, some who are living today, and their lives speak to me through the way that they live, through the courage that they exhibit as they seek to live out a life that honors God in this generation. One of my heroes of faith is a 20th century person. He was a pastor in Germany during Hitler's rise to power and during his reign over Nazi Germany. His name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Many of you know that name. Some of you may have even read the incredible biography written about his life. It's really worth reading. But Bonhoeffer was a man that quickly understood the threat of Nazism. He quickly understood the threat that came with how Hitler was influencing the national German church. And he began to speak out against Nazism. He began to speak out against the worship of Adolf Hitler as an idol. And because of that, his life was threatened. He, could, he was going to be arrested. And he fled Germany, went to Great Britain, and then came to the United States where he was teaching. And he taught here for a little while until the conviction of the Spirit drove him to return to Germany during the war. Who does that? Who does that? Who would go back to Nazi Germany during the course of the war to speak out against Adolf Hitler and to speak out against the direction of the German church. Well, Bonhoeffer did. It wasn't long before he was arrested and he was imprisoned and he was one of the final people that was put to death at the end of World War II by the Nazis. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I want to show you a quote that stirs my soul every time I read it. I want to read it to you, and you can read, uh, just follow along as I read. Just let these words speak to you this morning. Christianity stands or falls with its revolutionary protest against violence, arbitrariness, the pride of power, and with its plea for the weak. Christians are doing too little to make these points clear. Christendom adjusts itself far too easily to the worship of power. Christians should give more offense, shock the world far more than they are doing now. Friends, I think these words could be spoken in any generation, including our generation today. We are to shock the world by standing for the things that the world would never stand for. We are to shock the world by speaking truth into the circumstances of our culture. This morning we're beginning a new series, and it's, it's going to be an amazing series. And it began back in January and February when we gave you the opportunity to give us questions that you wanted us to address in this summer series. Well, you sent in far more questions than we could ever deal with in a summer. But what we have done is to try to bring some of those questions together. And every Sunday through Labor Day, we are going to be dealing with different questions that you have. And these, some of these questions, like this morning's, are not easy questions to answer. In fact, I can't think of one Sunday where we're going to have an easy response to the question that was asked. We don't have all the answers. We want to bring to you biblical perspective. We want to bring to you biblical truth. But there is also a sense where we need to be driven by the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, as we'll see this morning as we talk about what the Bible teaches about politics. And so if you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to turn to Romans chapter 13. 
I'm going to be reading from the first seven verses, and these are very, very challenging, challenging verses. And we're going to look at them today, and we're going to ask the question, what does this mean for us as we live in our culture today in the year 2023? Next week, we're going to pick up on this theme. Really, these first two weeks kind of go together because the question we're dealing with next week is this. How do we as Christians respond to a culture that is increasingly moving further from God? How do we respond? What do we do? Do we do anything? We're going to look at what the scriptures teach about that next week. But beginning in verse 1 of Romans 13, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. That's a powerful statement. This is also why you pay taxes. Amen? Woo, 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 right? This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. This is a very challenging passage. And what I want to do this morning with you is I want to begin by looking at an overarching principle. After we look at that overarching principle, I want to talk about, I want to make three statements about what we should demand and expect from government. What the Bible teaches that government should provide. We should expect it. We should demand it. In America, we should vote for it. And then I want to talk about how we as people in this republic, or in any republic, how we are to respond to any level of government, whether it's local, whether it's state, whether it's federal. How we are to respond to government. Now, in saying all of this, and I'll mention this next week, but we are first and foremost citizens of God, not citizens of America. We have dual citizenship. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God first and foremost. And God has planted me as a citizen of the United States of America. And he gives direction to how I, I am to live and you are to live in that context. Well, here's the overarching principle and it's a hard one, but let me walk us through it, and let's see if we can understand it together. The overarching principle is that rulers are established by God. God is the one who has established government. And if we believe in the sovereignty of God, we believe that God is the one who has brought people to lead government. Now, we're going to look at how hard that is in just a moment. It's challenging. It's hard to understand. It's hard to accept. It's one of the things that, that I've struggled with over the years. Now listen to what we read. Let everyone be subject to governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. What is he saying here? Well, first of all, God is the one who established the order that we call government. Now, if we look to the Old Testament and the nation of Israel, it was God's intent that he would always be 
the government for his people. He would be their king. They would need no other king. He would be their king. But then the people rose up and said, no, we want to have a king like the nations around us. And God warned them. He said, any king you have apart from me is, will be sinful. And they will end up seeking what is best for themselves and not what is best for the people. Sound familiar? We have to understand in this passage that God has given Satan power in this world. His power is limited. God is always sovereign. His power is limited. But he has given him reign in this world. And what Satan knows is that if he can corrupt a leader, he can corrupt a people. He can corrupt a nation. If God, if, if Satan can stir in the heart of a leader and lead their heart away from God, they are going to end up creating a culture that walks away from God. God knew that when he established government, but he established this to create order, as we'll see in just a moment. Now, this is challenging. We see people like Pol Pot of Cambodia, Adolf Hitler. We see people like Joseph Stalin. We see people like the uh, ruler of North Korea. People that literally, out of their evil, out of the evil of their hearts, have killed millions of people. And yet we read, and God establishes rulers. How are we to understand that? Because we also know in Romans 8, 28, that God works together for his good in all circumstances of life. Let me help you with this. One thing that I know and I understand and I believe is that when God looks at time, he looks at all of eternity. When you and I look at time, we tend to look at a moment. God looks at all of eternity and his purposes and his plans will not be foiled. So how in the world can that kind of evil be used by God? Well, I think that it helps us to understand, it helps us to understand the impact of evil in our world. We're the ones who chose that in the Garden of Eden, and you and I, with our sin, we have, we have agreed with Adam and Eve, and we are seeing in these instances what happens when people walk away from God. We are seeing in these instances the darkness that can come into the world. It was never God's original design that we would, uh, he knew it was going to happen, but it wasn't his original design that we would have evil in the world and darkness in the world, but we chose it and now we are living as a result of it. It's hard to understand this. There was a, um, three scholars who were in a German uh, concentration camp. They were in Auschwitz. And these three Jewish scholars put God on trial in that concentration camp and found him guilty of indifference towards his people. They found God guilty of indifference toward his people. He had forgotten them from their perspective. You know what's remarkable in this? These three men, as soon as that ended, they went and they worshiped God. God, we don't understand our circumstances. We don't understand why this is happening. But God, we will continue to worship you. We will continue to look to you. What we have a tendency to do is that we look at our circumstances and we draw conclusions about God instead of looking at who God is and then trying to understand our circumstances in light of what is always true about God. He is always perfect in justice. He's always perfect in love. He's always perfect in goodness. 
He's always perfect in discipline. But when we look at our circumstances and we try to say this is who God is, it's going to take us to a bad place. We have to look at who God is and then understand our circumstances. Auschwitz doesn't change the reality of who God is. He is a God of justice. He is a God of love. He is a God of goodness. We may not understand that in a moment. We may not understand how that comes together. But I know one day I will stand before God. And God will reveal that truth, and I will understand it, and I will agree with it. But friends, there are questions, and there are mysteries that we live with. And for me, that's one of them. If I were God, I'd make every ruler good. Every ruler would be kind, and gracious, and loving, and just. Good thing I'm not God. God has a plan, and a purpose, and a design that is far better than anything that I could ever comprehend. This is hard, but God uses evil even for his purposes. He did in the life of Jesus, right? Pilate. Pilate had control over the life and the death of Jesus, the Son of God. And God put Pilate in that position of authority to sanctify, to agree to the crucifixion of his very son, to accomplish his eternal purposes. I can assure you the disciples didn't understand that in the moment. I can assure you Mary didn't understand that in the moment. The followers of Jesus who loved him didn't understand that in the moment. But God had an eternal purpose, and he used the evil of Pilate to accomplish, and, the, and the religious leaders to accomplish his purpose. There's going to be mystery in this for us. And there are going to be times we just say to God, I don't get it, I don't agree. But that doesn't change the reality that God remains who he is. He is the ultimate king and leader and ruler of our lives. He is the one that we worship. He's a God of love and grace and mercy and justice and judgment. Now, having said that, what I want to do is I want to talk about what a government we should expect and demand from government, biblically. Here's the first thing that we see. Governments, their responsibility is to punish evil, to establish justice, because that's the nature of God, and to promote good. That is the nature of God. Listen to what we read. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. Now, some people believe that Paul is just creating this perfect picture of what could be. What's remarkable in this is that Paul is writing these words when Nero the evil, the most evil of all the emperors of Rome is, is the Caesar of Rome. Nero, who killed Christians, persecuted Christians. Nero, who had Christians captured and then had them dipped in wax and they burned them as candles in Nero's, in Nero's palace. And yet Paul says that we are to submit to government authorities. We'll bring balance to this in just a moment. For the one in God's authority, in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. So they become instruments of God's justice. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring the punishment on the wrongdoer. This is to bring order to culture. This is to bring order to society. There has to be boundaries. There has to be that which is right, that which is wrong. We need to punish the people that are killing. We need to punish the people who, as an instrument of God's judgment, we have to punish the people that are hurting others and promoting oppression. Here's a second thing that we should expect from our government. It's to protect the oppressed. 
We read in Psalm 72, and there's so many passages about this, in verses 1 and 4. Endow the king, he's praying for the king, endow the king, O God, with your justice. Let me read that again. Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. May he defend the afflicted among the people. May he save the children of the needy. May he crush the oppressor. God has a heart for the oppressed. God has a heart for the unprotected. God has a heart for those who are in desperate need. God has a heart, and it's the responsibility of the government to live out the heart of God among the people. God established all sorts of laws where the people would provide for even the alien, the undocumented alien in their midst. He would say, as you have a stranger coming through our country, through your country, through your land, make sure that you don't take all of the food from the outside of your crops so that they have something to eat. God provided for the widow. He provided for the orphan. And one of the responsibilities of government is to protect the unprotected. And we're going to talk more about that later this summer as we talk about the issue of abortion. The uh, third thing that I want you to see is that government is to establish and maintain peace. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. We are to, the role of government is to establish and promote peace. Now, peace is not the absence of conflict. Conflict is often necessary to come to the point of peace. And we have to discern that. And we have to figure that out with the leading of the Holy Spirit. And so what we see is that the role of government is to establish peace, that we may have peace in the land, wherever that land may be. Now, having said that, I want you to notice that we are to pray, to intercede, and to give thanks for all people. What did I say? How many? What people? All people. Well, wait a minute, not my neighbor. Not my boss. Oh my gosh. Not the President of the United States. I don't even agree with him. You are to pray for all people who are in authority over us. Every ruler. Every ruler. Everybody in government over us. Local, state, and federal. I have had people get angry with me when I prayed for the last president, President Trump, in our service. Because I do that in light of 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. And I have people get angry at me when I pray for President Biden in the service out of 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. And if that makes you angry, I want to challenge you to begin to pray for the very people that you're angry with. Because how can we expect, if God is calling us to pray for them, you see, friends, the battle that these leaders are in is a spiritual battle and if we are not praying for them how can we expect them to rule in a way to lead in a way that honors God we spend far more time critiquing and criticizing and being angry with those in authority than we do praying for them and that is a challenge for us as God's people now let me quickly talk about the responsibility we have to government. Those are three things we should expect from government. Those are three things we should hold them accountable for. Now, let me say, every ruler is held accountable by God. Every ruler and the power of their position puts them in a position where they have heavy influence over the lives of people. They have heavy influence over culture, as we'll see next week as we kind of blend these first two weeks together. But as a general rule, We are to submit to those who rule over us. We are to submit to those who rule over us. Now, that word submit is a word that was used in that day to describe 
the position that a soldier took to the ranking officer. You know, yeah, I know you're my general, but I just, you know, I just don't really want to do what you asked me to do today. How's that going to go over? Have you been in the military? Have you seen a war movie? You can't do that. You have to obey your, obeying, your, your commanding officer. In the same way, we, as a general rule, we are to follow those who have put in, been put in authority over us. We are to submit to them. We are to subject ourselves to them. Listen to what we read here in verses 1, 2, and then verse 5. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. Verse 5, therefore it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of po possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. Now what does that mean? He goes on to say, if you owe taxes, what are you supposed to do? Pay your taxes. Now, don't think that Paul doesn't understand, says, yeah, 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 well, that was way back in the first century. He doesn't get it. You know, if you were living in America today and knew how we were being taxed in California, there's no way. You know what was happening? In AD 60, there was a revolt in Rome because of high taxes. Sound familiar? Because of high taxes. And so Paul is saying, no, 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 no. We as Christians, we are to live peacefully as much as we can in the world. We are to subject ourselves. We are to pay our taxes. We are to do the things that we're supposed to do. We are to follow the law. Think about that next time you're going 56 in a 55 mile an hour zone. We are to obey the law. Now, here's perspective. There are occasions we must choose to stand against government. Where do I get that? I get that from the Bible. Listen to what we read here in Acts 5. Listen to what we read. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders. Now remember, these are people that are standing in authority over them. We gave you strict orders not to teach in, his, in this name, teaching in the name of Jesus. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than man. The rule is that we submit and subject ourselves to government unless God calls us, unless government is calling us to do something that brings us against the will of God. If government is asking me to worship an idol, we are not to worship the idol. We do not subject ourselves to the government if the government is telling us to do something that is in opposition to the will of God, right? We see this in the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember, they were asked in the book of Daniel, they were not asked, they were commanded by Nebuchadnezzar, the king, to worship the idol that he had, that he had made. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, no, 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 no. That, that breaks the second of the Ten Commandments, if not the first as well. I will, we will not worship that idol. They're not subjecting themselves to the will of the king. God miraculously saves them. But friends, there are times when we need to say no because it's the command of the government is putting us in a position where we are saying no to the will of God. The will of God is our ultimate priority. I am first and foremost a citizen of the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of this earth. And so we are to say no. Now this is where it gets dicey. 
This is where it gets really, really hard. We need the discernment of God to understand when we are to stand against the government. This is not easy. This is really hard. Now, sometimes it might be obvious. Now, looking back on World War II, people filling the churches of that day, they embraced, they embraced Adolf Hitler. They worshipped Adolf Hitler. There's something called the Barman Confession of Faith that was written by German theologians at the time that Nazi was, Nazism was growing, which deals with the issue of idolatry. It was speaking about the church worshiping Adolf Hitler. And so we know that's wrong. We know we're not supposed to do that. We're not going to do that. Although, I'll tell you, it scares me that a whole nation of Christians were more caught up in nationalism than they were the Word of God. Don't think that can't happen to us. And so, what do we do? Well, I love what Bonhoeffer did. Bonhoeffer went back, he refused to be quiet, calling the church to holiness. He was arrested, he was accused of trying to be part of a group that looked to assassinate Adolf Hitler. That's the charge they brought against him. And they threw him in prison and they killed him. He stood up. He stood up. And I think he was right in doing so. Because the people needed to hear a voice that was calling them out of their slumber to understand what God was saying. You know, when this nation was founded, there were many Christ, devout Christians that did not support the Revolutionary War. They did not support what the colonies were doing in revolting against Great Britain. You know why? Based on 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 to 7. They did not believe that what was happening had risen to the level where they should stand against and not subject themselves to England. Now, obviously, you had a lot of other pastors and devout Christians who said, it absolutely has risen to that level. We need to stand. We need to revolt. See, we look at this side of history, and we think, oh, it's a no-brainer. Not if you live then. Do you see it? That's not such an easy thing to process and work through. You see, friends, it becomes a matter of conscience. As we're led by the Holy Spirit, you cannot do this apart from the Holy Spirit. I think one of the hardest things, well, I can't think, I know, one of the hardest things I've ever been through as a leader was going through the whole issue of this last three, four years as we dealt with the fun of COVID. But what was challenging was we had people who believed that what California government, what the government was calling us to do and not allowing us to gather indoors together was causing us to limit our religious freedom in such a way that we were being asked to not follow the will of God. In that case, it was a natural decision. We disagree with the government and we rebel against the government. You had other people that were saying, no, this is this makes sense, and we can still worship online. We still worship outdoors. Is it as good? I thought outdoors was pretty cool, but I know you didn't. But it, we look at that, and we think, oh, my goodness. People on this end were saying, no, we've got to subject ourselves to the government. This is reasonable. This is being close quarters. We're going to breathe on each other, and it's an issue. I know people in this camp and I know people in this camp, and I love them both. Because I get it. I get it. And from their perspective, it seemed very simple. I don't think it was that simple. And it is a very hard issue for us. But friends, I would lead very differently than I led. I learned a lot. Can you believe at my age I'm still learning? Thank goodness, right? I would lead very differently. 
I didn't see the issues as clearly as I do in retrospect. Isn't that life? But that's hard. I get it on both sides. But friends, what we need to do is to seek the Holy Spirit's leading and guiding in these kinds of decisions. We don't make a decision to not subject ourselves to the government unless we are really convinced as a matter of conscience and as a matter of the Word of God that what the government's asking us to do is inconsistent with the will of God. Let me close with this. As government grows in any culture, people become dependent on government. This is always risky for Christians. My hope is not in my government. My hope is not in our military. Our hope is not, my hope is not in the strength of the dollar. My hope is in Jesus Christ. And I am following him and asking him to do an amazing work in our nation and in our leaders and in our people and in our churches. And friends, it starts with you and me. We need revival before we ask God to bring revival to the world. We need repentance before we ask God to bring the world to repentance. We need surrender before we ask God to bring our leaders to a point of surrender. We need to lay our lives before him in obedience. Now, we, put, we read this in Psalm 146.3. Do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. We live at a time when politics are, whew, I mean, has anybody else noticed that? Is that just me? It just seems like it's really a big deal, and it seems like people are really angry on both sides. You know what it tells me? That we think that government is our hope. Government's not my hope. Now, I want a great government because I want to live in peace. I want to live in justice. And I want a government that promotes good. I want the government to be a biblical government. I do. But that's not my hope. My hope's in the Lord. I love this passage that comes from Jeremiah 9. It says, this is what the Lord says. Let, the wise not, let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches. I think as a nation, we've kind of done that. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for in these things I delight, declares the Lord. Close with this little story. It's, um, I love reading the history books of the Old Testament. I think there's so much to learn from good examples and bad examples. But the reign of King Zedekiah of Judah, about 600 years before the birth of Jesus, and this is what happened. They had Babylon, I mean, uh, Babylon growing to the north as a great military power, and they were gobbling up everybody. Now remember, Israel, Judah is really small. To the south, they had to the where's south? Oh, that's south. Uh, to the north, they had uh, Babylon. To the south, they had Egypt, which was a great power as well. Now, if you're the little guy, what are you going to do if a bully looks like they're going to pick on you? You go find what? A bigger bully. That makes sense to me. Makes sense to me. I mean, that's human common sense. So Zedekiah decided, I'm going to go make friends and enter into a, uh, an agreement, a treaty with Egypt, so that if Babylon comes, Egypt will come in and beat them back. Here's the problem. The prophet came to Zedekiah and said, hey, God says do not enter that agreement because I will protect you. I will protect you. But Zedekiah didn't trust God. Zedekiah didn't trust God, so what he did was he entered into that agreement. Babylon destroys Egypt and then destroys Judah. 
Friends, I think we have a tendency to trust our government for the very things that God is to provide. And that becomes a heart issue for all of us, including me, okay? I'm learning right alongside you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, I, br- I pray that uh, anything that I said this morning that is not truthful, Lord, that you would reveal that to people. We want to be a people that follows your truth, that's committed to your truth, a people that loves your truth, a people that seeks the leading of the Holy Spirit as we live out that truth. Lord, may we not lean on our own understanding, but may we lean on the understanding of God as we seek to live this out in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.